Hi guys, welcome back to Mentor and yet another video podcast. So today on the podcast, I will be talking about autopilot use. When do we use autopilot? Uh, how do we use it? Why do we use it? And do pilots nowadays know how to fly the aircraft at all? And why do we even need have pilots if you have really good autopilots? That's what I'll be talking about. And this video today is going to be slightly different than the previous videos I've done. The reason for this is that I found out that through my questions that I have basically two types of subscribers. I have the subscribers that are really um, highly knowledgeable about the aviation world. Those would be the ones that are in flight training or are on the way into flight training or maybe fly a lot of simulator online or things like that. But I also have a second group that I've kind of neglected so far and that's the normal general public, the passengers that are still really, really curious about what's going on up there in the cockpit and want to know why certain things happen a certain way. And I haven't spent much time doing videos for you guys, but today I'm doing one of those and I want you guys to tell me what you like about it. If you want me to do these type of videos about other subjects as well. So let me know, tell me if there's anything else you want me to talk about and I will do that. Okay, that's, that's why I'm here. And also, I want you guys to stay on to the end today, because I will have a question towards the end of the podcast that I want you guys to answer. Because depending on what you answer that to that question, uh, I will reformat a coming podcast. So make sure that you watch the whole podcast to the end and answer the question in the comments field. For now, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. So, right, guys, welcome back. Um, so, autopilot. What do the pilots actually do? Um, what can the aircraft do? The autopilot is a little bit different when, than what most people think it is. Now, when most people think about autopilot, they hear the word auto and they think, all right, so it's probably automatic. It does everything for them. All right? That is not completely true. The autopilot is a tool that the pilots use in order to reduce the workload in the flight deck, really. So, as you probably know yourself, if you are trying to juggle three balls while you are simultaneously discussing a matter with someone else, you will be missing part of the conversation because you're focusing on getting those balls you know, correctly down and that you're having them under control as you're juggling the balls. Now, the reason for that is that the human brain is slightly uh, limited. There is only so much we can do. We can train it so we can automate juggling and you can probably give a good conversation in that case. But you're still not going to be as good as if you were not juggling the balls. Okay. This is why we have the autopilot. The autopilot is there to reduce the actual inputs that pilots need to do so that pilot can focus their energy on making decisions having a good overview of all the instruments, making sure that they perceive all the threats that are out there and attack them in a suitable manner. So the autopilot is really there, only to take away some of the work that the pilot is doing, but it's not taking away all of the work. It's not like if we were be pushing a button and sitting back, relaxing and reading a newspaper. We can't do that because if we do that, the autopilot is not smart, so it's going to make mistakes and it's going to make very bad mistakes if we're not constantly monitoring it, constantly tweaking it and telling it what to do. It's, it's very similar to, you know, the speed control that you have on some cars. You put that speed control in and in most cars it's just going to keep the speed going, no matter if there is a car going out in front of it. Um, the autopilot in the aircraft you, you, is kind of like that. You know, it, it will just do what you tell it to do, but what you told it to do in one second might not at all be the same the next one. Okay, It might not all be what you want it to do in two minutes or three minutes, which is why you have to continuously monitor what it's doing. So, when can we use the autopilot? Well, when we're on the ground, we never use the autopilot because the autopilot does not control it when you're on the ground. So when we're taxiing out to the runway of departure, it's always going to be one of the pilots that are controlling the aircraft. Well, that kind of makes sense. It's kind of like a car when you're driving it out. 
Then we line up the aircraft and we take off. And there are certain aircraft that can do this automatically. However, the one I'm flying, the 737, does not do this. So we always do all the takeoffs manually, which is why that forms part a lot of the type rating training and of the training that you do in the aircraft, because it's, every aircraft is gonna be slightly different. I've talked about this in a previous video about takeoff uh, handling technique, but the initial part of the takeoff that you feel as an aircraft, as a passenger, we know when the, when the engine is revving up and you're accelerating down the runway and you're taking off, it's going to be done manually. It's, the out, it's not flown by the autopilot, it's flown by the pilot that is pilot flying for that sector, okay? So when do we engage the autopilot? Um, this is slightly up to the pilot, okay? We have our standard operating procedures and in our standard operating procedures we want to get the autopilot in as early as possible for the reasons that I gave you before. Namely that we are close to the ground so we want both pilots to be able to monitor the instruments and monitor the traffic pattern around so we have maximum capacity in the flight deck. And we do that by engaging the autopilot at a fairly early stage. Generally it tends to be done at around a thousand feet which is about 300 meters above the ground. Okay, but you are fully uh, allowed to continue flying the aircraft higher than that if the weather is good, there's not a lot of traffic around, uh, and there's no specific very, very complicated departure routes or that you would be in a big airport where you need to, to monitor the whole traffic situation around you. So if you're flying out of a small airport somewhere, it's a nice, good day, you can, during the briefing, discuss with the other pilot and say, today I actually want to hand fly the aircraft a little bit. And you're fully um, okay to do that, right? But generally we tend to put the autopilot in engaged mode during the climb somewhere maybe around 10,000 feet if we're choosing to hand fly the departure up. And the reason for that is really after that, the controlling of the aircraft is quite boring. You're going to fly more or less in a straight line. It's going to be climbing at a specific uh, indicated speed and then at a specific Mach number. Um, so it's not going to be that much fun hand flying the aircraft from then on. So the pilot flying then engages the autopilot. It chooses the climb mode that we think is most, is most um, appropriate, which tends to be VNAV. Uh, which is something I'll discuss in a different podcast. But VNAV is an intelligent autopilot mode. It basically does a little bit more than what the basic autopilot modes do. But I'll be talking about that later on, okay? So let's say on a normal flight, we would be engaging the autopilot then at 300 meters, at 1,000 feet. Let the aircraft climb out by itself but we are constantly as we're climbing out getting new climb clearances from air traffic control this means that air traffic control is telling us that now you can climb up to 10,000 feet so we put 10,000 feet into our um, mode control panel which is what governs the autopilot and would tell the autopilot that now you can climb to 10,000 feet and then you get further climb clearances. So we continue to tell the autopilot that now you're allowed to continue to climb. So it doesn't do this by itself. It, it doesn't think by itself. It doesn't listen to the radio. It just, tell, it just does what you tell it to do, basically. Pretty much like that speed controller that I was talking about on the, um, on the car. Another thing that it doesn't really know is whether or not you need to do any specific turns. So we tend to have um, put a route in. During the setup of the aircraft, we have programmed a route, pretty much like a GPS route that you would have on your car, okay? Uh, when we put VNAV and LNAV, LNAV stands for lateral navigation, the aircraft will follow that pre-programmed route, just like if the car would follow the pre-programmed route in your GPS, okay? But if the aircraft traffic control needs you to turn left or right, for example, because there might be other traffic that's climbing through your route or descending through your route, or they want you to keep separation to something else, then they will tell you that you need to turn left or right 10 or 15 degrees or something like that. And we have to do that by disengaging our lateral navigation, going into different autopilot mode and tell the aircraft where we want it to turn. So we continuously do that. And then we get shortcuts as well. Now, you might think that we're flying the shortest possible route to wherever we're going, which is not really the case. 
um, the skies above Europe and above the world is littered with um, basically roads in the sky. Okay, it's uh, big highways that everyone follows generally. So when we file our flight plan before every flight, we tell air traffic control that we are planning on following this specific highway. This specific highway does not go in a straight line. If I'm going from Barcelona to London, it doesn't go straight to London. It follows VOR navigation beacons um, and specific points which are GPS coordinated uh, over the continent. And it gives, it goes kind of like this all the way up, all right? Which is not the quickest or most efficient, or most fuel efficient, most environmentally friendly way of doing things. So our traffic control is continuously giving us shortcuts. Go direct to this point. Now you can go direct to that point. Now our autopilot does not know this. So we have to go in and physically alter our pre-programmed route to reflect what air traffic control is telling us to do. So we do that continuously as well. So as you can see, even though the autopilot is engaged, the pilots are now basically reprogramming the autopilot as we go, telling it what to do. But it is an enormous help because in the older days before we had smart autopilots, one pilot will be fully engaged in just, you know, turning the aircraft, putting the switches, putting the throttle in in order to get the, the, the correct speed and the correct climb speed and so on. So that would take a lot of capacity away from that pilot. And the other pilot, which is the one talking to our traffic control, would then have to monitor the other pilot, making sure that the aircraft is doing what it's supposed to do and the other pilot is doing what it's supposed to do. That has reduced quite a bit with the use of autopilot because now you have basically two pilots that are able to monitor what the aircraft is doing full time without engaging um, their brains too much in just the stick and rudder part. Okay, this is the main use of an autopilot. So this continues as we climb up and we are on our cruise level. We're sitting there the autopilot maintains the altitude, which is a great help. It maintains the lateral navigation that we've programmed it. And as I was saying before, we'll be getting shortcuts that we're continuously programming into the autopilot. But in cruise, there's quite um, the workload goes down quite a bit. So there is a possibility to sit up there and discuss other matters with the other pilot, with, with your colleague. So yes, during cruise, the workload up in the front, generally not that high. However, we continuously have to have contact with air traffic control and we continuously have to monitor, making sure that we're burning as much fuel as we're supposed to. We're not burning more, that we know where our alternate airports are along the route in case something would happen, in case someone gets sick, for example, something like that, so that we are constantly in the flight, even though we're not doing much during the cruise stage of the flight, okay? When it comes to our top of descent, prior to that, we would have set up the approach that we're expecting. We're listening to, um, to a transmission, a radio transmission from the airport we're going through, which gives us the weather and which runway we can expect. You also have something called ACARS, which can do the same thing, where we get a, basically a computer transcript of the weather and air, um, aircraft, sorry, and runway in use. And so on. So we would have um, briefed, which I've also talked about in a previous contact um, podcast. We will have set up the uh, navigation uh, radios and our course displays and stuff, everything in order to fly the approach that we're expecting to do. And then we let the autopilot do the job. When we tell it to start descending, it will start descending. We have several different autopilot modes that we can use depending on how we want it to descend, but generally we're using VNAV, vertical navigation mode. Right, so the aircraft will then be descending. It's the same thing there. You have to constantly monitoring it, making sure that the aircraft is doing what it's supposed to do, the autopilot is doing what it's supposed to do. But there's an added um, difficulty when, you, when you're in the descent, which is the aircraft would have calculated how much it needs to descend based on how much track miles, how far it is to where it's supposed to land, okay? Um, that is not always the case. Sometimes uh, air traffic control will give us a, an arrival route which is very long before you get to the runway. But that's somewhere halfway down that route. They will tell you, actually, we don't have too much traffic today, so you can just go straight towards the initial approach fix for the runway. 
that's going to cut away a lot of that track miles that the air aircraft thought or the autopilot thought that it had available in order to descend. And if that happens, it means that we're now much higher than we are supposed to be. So we need to do something about that. So we need to tell the autopilot to do uh, to descend in a different mode. We need to add drag to the air aircraft in order to slow it down and get rid of the energy. So there are things like that that we're constantly thinking about uh, as we're descending and preparing ourselves for in case it would happen. So as you can see, the autopilot is engaged all of this time, but we are doing quite a lot as we are descending. It's not like the autopilot could do this by itself. Then, when it comes to landings, most of the normal landings in good weather is done by the pilots. We fly, we're using the autopilot down the glide slope, which is um, an electronic kind of road down towards the runway. Uh, but at a specific time, generally before the minima, which happens at about 60 or 100 meters above the runway, so normally well above that, we disconnect the autopilot and we fly the aircraft completely manually. The aircraft has the capability, at least the 737 has the capability to land by itself. However, it doesn't do that as good as the pilots tend to do. Because it will pre-program a flare which is higher, it starts a flare higher than the pilots generally do, which means it uses more runway. So if we have a short runway, for example, we might not even be able to auto land. And the auto land also needs a specific instrument landing system, um, a CAT 2 or a CAT 3 programmed ILS to do this safely. And there's only a few airports, the major airports tend to have this, airports that are prone to a lot of fog tend to have this, but most airports, they only have a normal category one um, instrument landing system. So the aircraft can still do an outer land on these ones, but you have to be very careful because the, uh, the beams that are being used to fly this road down towards the runway are not as finely calibrated or protected as the ones with CAT2 and CAT3 ILSs. So in most cases, when you land an aircraft in good weather, it's going to be the pilot in the front who's doing the landing. If it's really foggy, you might be experiencing an outer land, but you will never know. It's not doing it smoother. It's just following a pre-programmed way of landing the aircraft that we continuously have to monitor as well. And then some air aircraft, some bigger aircraft, they have rollout capability, which means that it can land and then slow the aircraft down following the center line. Ours don't. So after the landing, once the nose wheel is on the ground, we disconnect the autopilot and auto throttle and we take it over manually from there and maintain the center line as we're decelerating the aircraft to begin taxiing off to the terminal. Right. So that's basically how much we're using the autopilot. If you have questions about this, then just send them in to me. Normally, during the, um, the, the best way of doing this is either on the comment section here on um, YouTube or send me via Instagram or Twitter, and I'm on Facebook as well. So if you have questions, just send it to any of those channels, and I'll try to um, I'll try to answer it for you. Now, here's a question for you for the next podcast, or for one of the next coming podcasts. What kind of an aircraft is easier to descend? A heavy aircraft or a light aircraft? Okay. What's easier to descend? A heavier or a light aircraft? Write me your answers to that questions in the comment section and uh, I'll discuss it on my next one. Okay, for now, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. I really, really enjoy to see all your new subscribers coming on here. So make sure you interact and make sure you let me know what you want me to talk about and I will do my absolute best to fulfill your wishes. For now, have a great day and I'll see you next time.